Um, where we are, and here's what we're going to do today, it's going to be very conversational. Um, all of the participants here are very well versed in this. They're not interested in giving uh, individual speeches, and I, I know they're interested in a dialogue, and then we'll have Q&A. Um, I am going to forego detailed introductions, but let's be clear, um, for those of you who have lives and other day jobs, um, you may not be as, as familiar with these folks, but if you're in the energy space, especially the electricity space, these folks need no introduction. But I'm going to give, at least just to get everybody on the same page, some perspective of where each of these folks um, lays in the business and, and, and in, the, in the regulation of, of electricity, and then we'll kick off um, with some intro remarks and get right into the topics, okay? So Chairman ha Hancock, right there in the middle, two, two to my left, two to your right on the screen, um, he is... Um, uh, a, a longtime senator, prior House member, has been at the epicenter of electricity policy and natural resource policy, frankly, for years and years. Very important uh, to our state. Um, is a business you know, person, does, uh, understands things from the private sector, understands the issues of electricity from both sides, and has the jurisdictional oversight of our Public Utility Commission, which leads us to the person immediately on his left <laughs> to your right, is Chairman Deanne Walker, who, no pressure chairman, is probably more important than a FERC commissioner. I'm not ever, you know, I don't, I don't know that most people, most people recognize that the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission is, is where a lot of lobby dollars, millions of dollars get spent um, trying to shape national policy. But because of the foresight of Texas policy leaders and the creation of a deregulated market that keeps FERC from having jurisdictional oversight over the ERCOT market, which is 90% of our grid. Um, the chairman of the PUC, although we take a hands-off approach, does have an extraordinary influence, you know, and the fact that Texas is the 10th biggest economy in the world, you know, makes that a pretty big deal. And, and I know Deanne's <laughs> laughing over there. Thanks, Mike, for no, no pressure. Um, but, but both the chairman Hancock and, and chair, chairman uh, woman Walker have just done an amazing job keeping us on track during some very challenging times, you know, it's great that Texas grows, but with that growth comes challenges like keeping the lights on, making sure that we can serve that growing demand for electricity. Um, our third panelist has also played a significant role as a public official in Texas, but in this role, sitting here today in his day job now, he's a part of keeping the lights on from the power generation side. Um, LCRA General Manager Phil Wilson is with us, and he heads a significant entity. I used to call him an employer a long, long time ago when I was a baby, uh, and they are, uh, serve hundreds of thousands, maybe even millions of Texans. More than a million now. More, more than a million Texans um, by generating electricity with a whole wide host of, of, of resources that I'm sure Phil will explain, and also transmission. And they are a river authority, and they have uh, a, an incredible responsibility over our highland lakes and actually <laughs> generate hydroelectric power with that. So that's as much introduction as you're going to get from me of the, of, of the folks on our panel, but I'm going to set the stage before we careen into these fun topics that I'm going to tee up and then obviously leave it for you all to also take us through some Q&A uh, and, and, and get questions answered that you have. So with regard to where we are, a um, lot of interesting events over the last weeks. Uh, we'll get there. Uh, but before we do, I want to talk a, a briefly, uh, go, kicking it off, talking about the the events of last summer. And most people paid attention to California last summer, um, but most people did so because of wildfires, not because of what happened immediately before those wide wildfires. Um, and that was really an unprecedented blackout event, rolling outages in the electricity market in California. Um, a very underreported issue. Now, can't blame the papers for jumping on the, you know, the, the, the big news of, of wildfires. But you know, many of us in the electricity space for the last couple of decades have said, you know, people aren't really going to wake up to how important electricity policy is until the lights go out. Well, the lights went out in California, and I'm not sure they started paying attention. Um, there are a couple things that are, are of note about California that I'll tee up, and then we'll get into a discussion with our panel. Um, two things that I heard a lot right after the events of last summer oh, you know, it was just because we didn't have enough transmission to import the power we need. For those of you who didn't know, um, California has implemented a series of very hostile policies toward fossil fuels in particular are moving away from nuclear power. And so they have become dependent during their peak periods when they need power the most on imports. 
from others that have the audacity to actually maintain those services. And they need them when they need them most, but when they don't, and when they're in what we call off-peak for the rest of the year, they generate primarily with their own in-state renewable resources with the help of some natural gas that they don't really acknowledge. But that's what's going on in California, and it's a very difficult, some may say unsustainable, system where out-of-state generators are asked to park on the sideline for the vast majority of the year and then bail California out. You can't ignore California. It's a big state with a big economy and a big demand for electricity when they need it. And so they're a major customer. So they drive policy and they're really causing major disruption in the Mountain West in particular where I also do a lot of work and interesting challenge. And we'll talk a little bit more about that from the t Texas perspective um, in terms of distinguishing what we do here. Another thing to say about California is that what was remarkable right up until the, the wildfires was the acknowledgments that were actually happening within state government in California. California Governor Gavin Newsom said the words in quoted you know, newspaper articles that we need to sober up about renewable energy policy and its impact on reliability of our grid. Wow, think about that. Why wasn't that on the front page of the New York Times, right? I, I won't sit here and gripe about the media's lack of attention to that, but I will give the governor some uh, you know, respect for at least acknowledging that. And I think California regulators and Chairman Walker may, may comment about this have a difficult job of, of sobering up themselves and what are they gonna do about all that? So with that prelude, I wanna kick off uh, uh, some questions for the panel about talking about California. Um, I don't think anybody at this conference, and there are hundreds online, we wanna say thousands, but I'll say hundreds, um, the, that, that are, 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 are tuning in, that already know Texas isn't California, and, but they, I don't know how much they've thought about how electricity policy plays into that statement and how important it is. So I'll start with Chairman Hancock because he comes from a perspective of having that private sector and the role and the distinctions between a business atmosphere in Texas versus California and the way, cal you know, the way electricity kind of contrasts. So you know, many have said, uh, Chairman, that you know, oh, it's OK. Everything's going to work out. We can build transmission out of our problem for California and we'll build big batteries. But, but would you agree that, that others, others I think more informed critics, believe that you know, their policies, their, 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 their hostility toward what we call thermal power plants powered by coal gas and nuclear power um, is at the heart of their problem and, and, and how does that contrast with what you're trying to accomplish in Texas? Well, Mike, I think that's part of it. I think really it's driven a step before that and it really is their politics that have driven their policies and so you talked about being sober-minded i think the all three of us up here um in many aspects are very sober we're not you know we're not very uh quick to react uh, but and think long term have a long-term perspective and that's really what you've got to have in this sector so when you're looking at uh, this market, you have to th have a long-term viewpoint. You have to look out beyond uh, tomorrow uh, to see what's needed. In fact, I remember when I was in the House, uh, Speaker Strauss at the time asked me to meet with some uh, California elected officials who were here, and we talked about energy policy a little bit, and, and they acknowledged that they were sober enough in a private meeting to acknowledge we've got to do things different in our energy market. But they also follow that with saying, and that this is the reason I bring up that really politics is driving it more than you know, policy for them because it links together. They said, if we were to do what we know we need to do, we would never be elected again. And so I, I guess a little bit of it is in order to deal with this sector, you have to really go, I'm more concerned with doing what's right, which is what Texas has tried to do, than I am getting elected to office once again. Uh, because what's popular, which right now renewables are very, very popular, is not al always feasible long term. And we've got to project really long term, especially in the state that's growing the way we are. Um, and you don't get the positive press from it. You know, nobody writes positive press, but this is really good long term for the economy and business. Uh, but I remember when we were looking at the policy changes, I had just come into the House. And I mean, the news stories on how expensive our electric rates were going to be if we adopted this new, more free market program were all over the media. 
But yet, when you look at today, when California homeowners are paying sometimes three times what Texas homeowners are paying, right. I, it's hard to find an article. I mean, they're getting hammered. I mean, we yeah. have people moving to Texas that are tired of having to having their refrigerators go out at night because they don't have any electricity because the wind's not blowing and the sun's not shining, and they can't buy their grocery. They have to buy groceries short term. They cannot have a freezer in the garage because they never know when that freezer is going to go off and all their meat's going to go bad. They mm. don't know whether they get when they get their electric car home and plug it in at 5:30 at night that if the wind's not blowing and the sun's gone down, whether they'll actually be able to charge their car at night. And we. I mean, we are more business-minded and more sober in thought of, okay, what do we have to do to make sure the lights stay on? Um, and we try to do that in a very pragmatic approach. I know Deanne and I talk a lot, uh, Chairman Walker, uh, a, a lot, especially during times where sometimes we do get pressure of, well, y'all need to do this policy or that policy. And it also takes... Um, that willingness to go against the grain to go, you know what, let's just kind of wait and let the market work itself out. Um, and in this market, we, we deal we do with some strange influences from the federal government when it comes to renewables that do disrupt the free markets that we have. So anyway, I, I do think it's, it is policy, yeah. but it is politics for those in California because um, they know right. this is what people want. Right. It sounds sexy, it sounds good, but it's not always practical. Right, that whole perception, everybody, I hope, I hope you, if you, if you came in late, you, you know, one of the biggest problems we deal with is just the educational level, the energy IQ of the audience. So many people perceive, I mean, what could possibly be wrong about wind and solar and there are resources that are worth harnessing for sure, but there are consequences to the grid. And if they don't understand it at the ballot box, they're just gonna vote one way or another. So I'm glad, I know Chairman Walker's glad that Chairman Hancock covered the political side, and she probably <laughs> would need about two hours of her own just to answer this question, so why not, I'll ask it. Which is, when you think about it from the standpoint of a regulator who, who really believes and oversees a market that's designed to be market first, let the market work, what are the systemic problems, aside from just the structure of their electricity market? Do you have any observations that you can share with us because I mean you're you're a steeped in so many of the, the details um, in terms of just contrasting kind of how they've grown to be so dependent on imports or, or, or obviously intermittents um, and how that contrasts to kind of our situation. Well I think it starts with the, the market structure we have an energy only market that's what has been working here uh, and it, it sends <laughs> it, it sends the signals to to not only the generators to where to build what to build um, and what to do we we made some changes in a, a few years ago and the generators responded by doing a lot of maintenance they didn't building new renewables but they did a lot of maintenance on gas units and coal mm -hmm. units. Uh, that, that brought up the, the megawatts that those could provide. And um, so, so you're dealing with the generators, but you're also wanting to send those price signals to the customers. And um, that, that's one of the things that you look at any uh, chart. Uh, right after we made the changes we did, there were some high prices. People adjusted last year. Um, it, it, I am proud to say that the, the customers adjust too, and it takes both of those in an energy only market. It takes the entire market working together to make it work. Um, when I first got my job, I think within a month, four coal power plants shut down, and we went from an 18% reserve margin down to like a nine, and then we went down to a seven, and I really enjoyed my job. Um, <laughs> we're, we're, we're back up because of those investments generators are making, because the energy only mark, uh, market sending those signals, and the customers come off when we need them to come off because we're sending those signals. That's not happening in California. They don't get the, the transparent signals that I believe happen here in Texas or in ERCOT. Let me go yeah. back to ERCOT. Um, the, the other thing is they do, like you said, they, they uh, don't have um, a market and a, a politics that support building anything other than renewable, so they have to buy that base load and that, um, that, so what happened in California, you, you set it up, but what happened is 
the sun went down at five, the wind didn't start blowing till seven or eight, and there was no power because everyone was in a heat wave in the entire west coast. It wasn't just California. So when weather happens, it's a lot of heat. It's not just in California, it's in that whole region. And so Arizona, Nevada, all those places that they contract for power said, no, we need it to serve our customers. We're not gonna send it to you. ERCOT, as you set up, is very lucky. We're not dependent on that. So we as ERCOT, we as the people on this stage, have to plan for us to be independent and stand on our own. And I think that's a benefit that other states actually don't have. Um, I love the ERCOT region, the ERCOT market. I love everything about it. I, I say nationally, I think it's the best RTO and ISO in, in the United States. And I think that's uh, the other thing we have going is that ERCOT has been given a lot of tools to manage this system. They do a very robust transmission planning. Uh, we don't site generation. We can't force generation to be built. Um, we are blessed that a lot of wind and sun's here, so uh, we do have those renewables, but we need that um, other power to stay on t so that when we leave that, we're, we have started defining it as net load. Uh, when you lose the wind and solar and you don't have the, the generation right there and you've got too much load, what, what do you do to balance those? And, uh, it's a struggle for us, but I think ERCOT is really good at it. I think they do a great job. I talk to them all the time in the summer. I'm on the phone with them all the time, and then with Chairman Hancock the rest of the time, or the governor. I mean, the governor's staff and the governor are very interested in making sure that the lights are on. And um, Phil and I were having a conversation earlier that we are blessed that a lot of companies are moving here, a lot from California for certain reasons. And uh, that's one of my fears is making sure we have the generation to serve them. We can build all the transmission in the world, which I can order to be built. Mm -hmm. I can't order generation. So we need to make sure we have these policies in, in place so that we're able to serve all the economy moving here. Yeah, and we'll take questions at the end because I want to make sure that you get the perspectives. I mean, this is an incredible panel from a dynam dynamic perspective, right? So you, so before I tee it up for Mr. to Mr. Wilson, he would never ask for thanks, but I can assure you, everybody, including the other folks on this market, would say thank you to the men and women of LCRA and people like them because they are, unlike the generators uh, that California depends upon that they pushed out of the state, our generators are right here to serve us um, and, and what Chairman Walker's talking about, how do you maintain a market-focused uh, you know, approach given a bunch of external forces that we'll talk more about in the next topic um, and, and still figure out a way for the economics to work for generators to stay open? Like, like Chairman Walker said, we, we can't mandate, we can't direct that, we can't really even incent it. But what we can I mean, do is make sure we our market. Could. We, we could, we could, but we choose not to. Right. Because, Other states do, and it hasn't worked right, well far. Exactly, and so that's the, the, the magic sauce of the next 10 years, frankly, that, that I'm no pressure, Chair, uh, Mr. Wilson, but that we're gonna have to figure <laughs> out is how do we keep the economics healthy? How do we preserve that market dynamic and structure and keep the economics healthy enough so we don't see attrition in our own fleet? So no pressure on Is that. Is there a question with that? <laughs> <laughs> How do you feel about California? Or, a, other than being glad you're not located there, okay. uh, uh, other than the weather maybe. Um, and and what, what is a generator uh, and a transmission uh, uh, provider is a lesson learned from the California experience? Yeah, a couple of things. Thanks for having us today. Appreciate it very much uh, to be with you all talking about this. I'm gonna go to California for a second and talk about Texas. So one thing that gets missed in that conversation is that many of the wildfires were caused by transmission sparks. And the system was 100 plus years old. So you had stuff that was built before World War I that sparked a fire. And part of the reason it wasn't because they hadn't done an aggressive program for maintenance, such as tree trimming, which we do under our PUC and our legislature. They also didn't have a maintenance program as aggressive because they were focused so much on renewables, they had to go buy that, which has a price impact along with transmission having a price impact, so they chose their poison. They chose the ability to go get renewables in the marketplace, and they were not able to spend the same effort on doing their transmission upgrades. 
So in a sense, you had a perfect storm. Uh, you didn't have the ability to transport. People wouldn't come in when it was hot. You then had this wildfire spark, and you have this, this tremendously horrible thing take place. Uh, and my brother lives in San Diego. He grew up with me in Brownwood, so he's out there in that part of the world. I talk to him at least once a week. And I get a sense of how challenging it is out there for people that, that I care about. And, and, and the intent of having renewables is not a bad intent. I mean, we talk, I'm agnostic to power supply. Electrons make electrons, and that's, that's a good thing. And Texas has been blessed by a lot of wind and a lot of solar, and that's a good thing as well. The challenge becomes if you have, as the chairman talked about, the federal kind of tipping the scales with production tax credits and investment tax credits, where you create this disincentive where they get paid even when pricing goes negative. So think about that. If you're in the marketplace and you have a credit and you get paid when it's negative, and you're on the other side of the balance sheet making natural gas, electricity, or coal-fired electricity, or anything else, and you don't get paid, you tip the scale that way to those who are in the marketplace over here. The second thing we did as a state, which sounded good at the time, was I'm going to go back 20 years when the internet wasn't being taxed. And there's an analogy to this. The internet was nascent. It was just starting off. You look at Amazon today, they figured that out. Did they now we're taxing them? But we didn't tax them for a while. In Texas, when CRES was being built, we made a decision point that ancillary services out of wind, and that is that when they don't blow, they just don't blow. And I'm pro-energy market. That's, that's our nature of who we are. But everyone else, if you're a coal fleet or a natural gas fleet and you don't show up, you have to go buy power from someone else for your shortfall. That's how it works. And so we have an inherent challenge that's what's taken place since 2015, and Chair Walker alluded to this, we've lost 8,000 megawatts of coal and natural gas in our marketplace. Not all of that's driven by renewables. Part of it's just older fleets, part of it's environmental reasons, but they're not here anymore. And so a marketplace that was like this, when prices moved around, because of 26,000 megawatts of wind, and going to be soon probably 16,000 megawatts of solar in the next three years, which is going to be more than a third of our marketplace, nearly close to half, we've created this volatility. So to the points made, when the wind doesn't blow and the sun doesn't shine, you've got to have a backstop. You've got to have baseload power to support the system. And so that's an inherent challenge in our system today. Volatility has been reduced. It's an issue for the state. We don't want to be California. And we have to have an honest conversation about how do you ensure that we have all those jobs coming here and we keep selling Texas as a place to do business, that we're going to have a grid, most importantly, even more important than pricing, is grid reliability. And I know that's what they spend a lot of time on to make sure that when it shows up that ERCOT does the great job they do, they're not put into a box because there's not power. And the last thing I'll close with is this. When you go back to high school physics, you remember inertia? And you always had that molecule, you know, electron move made to be. That means the grid's electrified. That's the best way to put it. It's running at a certain level point. You've got to have baseload power made today by thermal, coal, natural gas, nuclear, whatever you're going to call it for that, to make sure your lines have inertia. If you move off of that and you go below a certain point, you run the risk of what we're all concerned about, which is your grid's not as reliable as you want it to be. So we're, we're in a great spot as a state. We have all those tremendous things taking place. But to Chair Hancock's point, we're thinking about the five to ten years down the road to make sure that our politics don't make our policy do it California where you can't take the votes anymore and you're too past, too far past the game. Right. And for those that hadn't paid attention, and it, it's, it's complex, so it's easy to not want to get that bogged down in the details. What was just referenced, this fact that we have outside influence, the fact that people get paid to produce even when they're not needed, is a factor we have to grapple with. I mean, we are this incredible, especially in ERCOT, right, energy-only deregulated market, but we don't truly live in a vacuum when those economic factors influence. In other words, uh, Washington, D.C., despite our ability to structure our way away from FERC oversight, can still, using the terminology of my kids, screw things up. And so that creates challenges. And, and listen, let's just take a moment and celebrate what has happened. I mean, that volatility that Phil's talking about has been in our market, and it is a, just an incredible accomplishment by the men and women at ERCOT, the men and women at PUC, and Chairman Hancock and, and his, his equivalents in the House to figure out a way to actually deal with that market distortion. We have a lot of information on this at Life Powered about the market distortion. I'm not going to distract from it. It's real. It's, it's a clear and present danger. Other markets are, frankly, not dealing with it as well as we have been able to. And that's a perfect transition into our next topic, which is, okay, we talked about California. 
Oh, an election just happened. Um, I'm a big fan of ZZ Top. Uh, so what do those two things have in common? Um, California, energy policy, is going nationwide. And as ZZ Top said, they're bad and they're nationwide. So that, sorry, I can help it. Uh, my, my son is just I thought you were a charm dressed man. I wasn't sure where that was going. Yeah, so exactly, right. exactly. So being bad and nationwide when it comes to California's electricity policy is particularly scary. We can take some solace for the reasons that, that, that both chairmen identified that much of that can't touch us on the FERC side. But boy, can the massive acceleration of incentives to offset, you know, to, to create these financial distortions do some damage. So really there's two parts to any discussion of what might happen in a Biden administration, which is where this is going, right? There's an environmental regulatory piece, which I will start with, and I think we can get taken care of pretty quick because most of it, we don't know yet how bad it's gonna be. There's only so much we can say. And then we'll return back to this kind of utility policy piece because let's be clear if you all haven't read, the president-elect's policy is that by 2035, the electric grid will be completely decarbonized. That means there will be no net thermal generation from coal and natural gas, which dominate and support the infrastructure of almost every grid, well, of every grid in the country, and certainly are a huge piece of ours. So we're gonna get there, but on the environmental regulatory side, which is a lot of what I do in my day job, I'll start with Chairman Walker, take the heat off of Chairman Hancock for a second and, and do it in reverse order. Um, Chairman Walker, I remember via, uh, uh, you know, vividly because A, you were new to the job and you, know, you got to inherit an Obama EPA you know, onslaught. Um, you did a great job of convening a bunch of, uh, of people, the other, a couple of other commissions and working together to try to figure out what our strategy would be to fend off some of those attacks to great success. A lot of people don't know that. Uh, pretty good success record in doing that. Um, you know, again, we'll talk more about the utility side, but on the environmental regulatory side, you know, we have a fleet, gas and coal. If, some, if the Biden administration's serious, they're gonna come after it, um, and they have the ability to do so through their regulatory authority. So, uh, I'm not asking you to predict what will happen and how bad it'll be, but maybe thinking just so, so people can all catch up on the way that our agencies collaborate. What do you envision? Do you envision that something similar to the last time where you all are comparing notes and convening experts might be the process you'll go through this time? So, Mike, I actually was still at the governor's oh, you office when we did that. And, <laughs> and um, we had the, the TCQ Railroad Commission and the PUC ERCOT also provided witnesses for us. Uh, I was there. We, was lot, yeah. we worked with the um, um, Attorney General's office. They were s instrumental in working with us. And, and it really was an effort of, of myself at the governor's office and those three commissions and the, the Attorney General's office filing lawsuits to say this doesn't work in Texas. It just does not work for our policies that we've decided to set in Texas and you should leave that to us. And you're impacting our, in, our energy policy by your environmental policies. And that's not right. We shouldn't have to change our energy policy, an energy-only market, and it would have changed that. I, I'm not an engineer. I um, am an attorney. <laughs> uh, but I, I think I understand the system, the, the transmission and generation of the electric system well enough to know that, and Phil will be able, you, you may also know the answer to this, but. You cannot run an electric system only on wind and solar. You have to have other generation to provide other services that are necessary. Yep. And so I am one of those, and again, I, I, I do, don't believe you can go to 100% renewable and have an electric system. And they may say I'm wrong and I will need to learn, go back to school and get my engineering degree. but. Uh, I don't think you can, and I think it's a political statement to make that you really can't accomplish, and you, um, we will still have to have uh, those things in place, those other types of generation in place, 
it will be a different balance. We won't have as much coal. Some of the coal we have now is going to have to shut down because it's not going to be economical. In Texas, what we are in ERCOT, what we have done is set up an energy only market that works, that sends those signals to the generators and to the customers that allow us to know the, the coal's not going to be economical anymore. It's going to need to shut down. We're going to have to build more gas. And that's where we are. Um, the timing I would like to have better than four units in one day shut down. It would be nicer to have a little bit more working room than that. Uh, but it's coming, I think, even if, uh, if the president-elect implements his and, and we are in lawsuits again like we were before and we end up winning, I think some of that's going to sh scare some of the coal to go ahead and close down some of those units that probably aren't economical or on that edge anyway. Um, so yes, we're going to work together on trying to make sure that the policies in Texas make sense for Texas, and if that means lawsuits, and my guess is it might, um, we've never shied away from that, and, and we will put together the same type of efforts we have before. Right, yeah, I know, and, and, and I, I just expanded you know, the chairman's tenure significantly by saying that. <laughs> because of the role that you played coordinating out of the governor's office, I mean, I can tell you just from being a, you know, an litigant in the case, I mean, the Fifth Circuit just hit, a, the, the Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals just issued a scathing opinion against the EPA in that time frame, really almost exclusively based on the work that the PUC, the governor's office, the AG's office did, quoting real basic simple concept that, you know, EPA, you're not an energy, you're not an energy policy agency. You're an environmental regulatory agency. And those two things are very different. And the Fifth Circuit not only struck down what they were doing, that was the regional Hayes FIP at the time, mm -hmm. they issued an injunction against the EPA and took down the rule, which mm -hmm. hardly ever happens. Hopefully we'll see repeated success. I believe the Fifth Circuit's only gotten better since then for a few people that actually were also involved in that fight from the governor's office. So um, that's a good thing. So Chairman Hancock, um, obviously Texas is so much a leader in every multi-state discussion, right? Um, this is gonna be one of them. Uh, again, starting with environmental, um, you know, I. I, I I, I talked about how the chairman is, is all things uh, electricity policy. Well, just based on his past chairman or his committee involvement, he knows a lot about environmental regulatory issues. And oh, by the way, he runs a business that has to do it too. So you know that impact real world. What do you envision being the collaboration with other states? How can Texas help you know, group other like-minded states to push back on that? And Mike, fortunately, good or bad, we have some history that we can reflect on uh, <laughs> with the previous administration. You know, I, uh, in fact, my son is at SMU Law School right now, and he just got through studying uh, environmental law, and his professor said, oh, by the way, with this election, all that's going to change. So that's how quickly environmental law changes, literally from one administration to the next. But we do have a track record. We know what works because it worked with Texas before in, in fighting this. And we did it in a collaborative effort, working with other states. Um, they are interlinked. And those that don't know the makeup of the, the Senate, you know, we have, I think we adopted 15 different committees. It is one of the things that, um, two things, is being chair of BNC, it is one of the things I've said, look, Lieutenant Governor, who makes those appointments, it is crucial that wherever energy policy is going, that someone is still on the committee where environmental policy is going because they, right. it, this last administration, not so much, but the coming one, yes, and the previous one under Obama, absolutely. You could not separate, you couldn't decouple energy policy from environmental policy because that's what they were doing at the federal level. And so, you know, that's where I've encouraged him, look, as chair of business and commerce, where, um, we deal with so much of the energy policy. We 97% of Texas economy comes through business and commerce. Nothing is more detailed. Do you deal with more minutiae than in the electric market? I mean, it just is. Everything else, you can micromanage it. Every little thing you do in the electric market, including environmental law, impacts that. And so um, we don't know what committees are, but I'm, I'm hopeful. I'm on both, so you can have that oversight and see what's going on, especially 
with the changes we're seeing. But we're going to be looking back over what we've done in the past. Fortunately, and I'm not an attorney, I'm just a hack, you know, business <laughs> graduate. So, um, but I've learned a lot, and precedent means a lot. And so that is the good thing here, is that we have precedent against EPA that really precludes them from trying that again because it's already been struck down. And so the good news is, is the work that was done previously um, will play into what happens, which is good. It means they'll come up with new tricks, <laughs> right? It's not going to stop them. It's just new tricks. And the whole policy of what the president, it's where I talked about, it's completely not practical, as Chair Walker pointed out. Oh, it's purely political, but it really sounds good. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, and, and Phil, you know, in terms of somebody who sits as a regulated uh, industry from an environmental perspective, you know, the LCRA, as I mentioned in the beginning, has a fleet filled with all different resources. As he said, he's agnostic, just give me the, just give me the megawatts or kilowatts. Um, you know, one of the things, the themes that we're concerned about in the environmental regulatory world is that the administration, the president-elect has announced and, 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 has, and frankly named the people that are major carryovers from the Obama environmental regulatory agenda. That may not be true on other areas, but on that agenda, boy, is it going to be a big part of it. And back then, there was this initial openness to natural gas power generation but eventual hostility and now outward hostility. I mean, there is no 2035 decarbonized fleet that has natural gas left. So as somebody who has both, yeah. who has, has already spent a lot of money in a, in a market where you don't make money spending that money uh, to get the fleet as clean as it can be and, and meet or exceed every regulation, both on your gas plants and your coal plants, um, what scares you the most about the Biden uh, EPA? How long are we going to go for? Uh, in all seriousness, it's a few things, and you alluded to this. London Clean Power Plant last time, uh, they basically shut every coal plant down in the state and got 25% of all the natural gas. So just start with that. That was last time. So whatever market design you got really doesn't matter at that point in time because you don't have a fleet. You're basically done. And we're, in ERCOT, we're gas on the margin. We mean, gas sets the price. And gas is the predominant fuel we use for production, especially as base load. The second thing, under your point, Mike, the new EPA administrator comes from North Carolina, where he's a very avowed regulator. And where they're probably going to back to where this is something called CCR. They're coal combustion residuals. You make ash when you burn coal. And we bury that ash. We have a lot of environmental rules around it, and it's very stringent. And one of the things they're talking about doing is saying, we want you to move all that. Well, that's just very cost prohibitive. We can get into the politics and policy, but if you're going to say to a coal-fired unit, you must remove all your coal combustion, which you can use actually for highways and for particle board and for a lot of other stuff, which is very safe, they make it more and more restrictive. And I think that's where they're going to go right out of the gate is on these what's called CCR rules. And we're in the process now of getting ours accelerated, adopted, because we already were in flight, but they could reverse that. And then the last thing, I guess, is the economics don't come into play at all. I think this is what concerns all of us, is that when you do analysis, I know our legislators do this, the PUC does it, is there's always a cost-benefit study involved, either, either because it's formal or because it's common sense. You say, when you trade off an environmental policy, what are your economic costs associated with that? That is never taken into consideration under the administration, because the goal is the goal. To Chairman Hancock's point, they make a sound bite, 100% by X, 2035, that sounds great. I'm sure there's no science behind it whatsoever. There's no a thought to can the reality of that. And then you get the California situation, how we started. And so that's what scares me is, as an economy that has just done so well in so many ways pre-COVID, and we're recovering out of that, jobs are being created, people are being hired, quality of life was enhanced, and we, because electricity is a big part of that. You know, it's, it's not the only thing, but it's a significant portion of being all the stuff we do in this kind of tech economy today and in manufacturing side as well, mm -hmm. that we're going to lose that because we're not having the conversation on what's it cost long term. Can right. I? Can yeah, I add, please, Chairman. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> so to, to what he said, though, is if, if you have all the coal shut down and 25% of the gas shut down, 
you don't have enough power to have electricity in ERCOT, and we don't have interconnections to other states. We, we can't legally be forced to interconnect and buy from other states. And so by setting policies that they're talking about, there would be no electricity. Well, there'd be some right. amount of electricity. And so you're telling your citizens you're, you can't have power because we're protecting the environment. And that, that's the concern. And I think that's why we were able to win those cases is because policies they're setting on that affects ERCOT in a much different way because we can't buy from what we buy from other places is minuscule yep. compared to what we need. Right. Yeah. I mean, everybody needs to understand the most important pleadings in the D.C. Circuit, Supreme Court, Fifth Circuit, wherever they are, when it comes to demonstrating irreparable harm on bad electricity policy come, or bad environmental policy that influences electricity policy come from Texas because ERCOT can say so many other places in this country um, can, you know, can, can scream correctly based on physics that they're going to have problems but they're not electrically isolated in a way where they actually can prove it. And that makes ERCOT you know, both a, a challenge, but an opportunity for demonstrating in a, in a very single state way, this is going to cause problems. So I hope you know, don't like that we have to do that, but at least we can. And when I referenced the Fifth Circuit opinion, that was a big part of it. And for those of you who didn't pay attention, the Clean Power Plan, which was the prior version of what we're likely to see again, uh, that Phil referenced, was stayed and joined by the Supreme Court. First time the United States Supreme Court has ever issued injunctive relief against a pending rule of any kind, let alone an environmental rule, okay? If that doesn't tell you how bad it was, nothing will. The court has only gotten a little less excited, I think, about those types of policies since the last time they sat to hear that case. Having said that, it looks from all indications they're planning on going there. So here we go again, unfortunately. Well, the good news is we have California last summer to show them it doesn't work. That's right. That's yeah, right. That's we don't right. have to just talk about it. We don't have to talk yeah, about it. We exactly. have a, a live <laughs> example of, oh, yeah, look at California. Here's what happens when you adopt these policies. The lights don't come on. Right, right. As right. much as you feel good about yourself. Yeah, you'll you feel, feel great. great about the fact the lights didn't <laughs> yeah. come on morally, but they don't come on. Right. So you kind of probably infer or take away from this conversation that so much of the environmental regulatory fight is really going to be, uh, you know, in terms of ERCOT's threats from the federal government, they primarily are actually on that side. Now, they are on this whole economic influence of deeper subsidies for intermittent resources. So I have a kind of a two-part question for each of our panelists to think about. Um, the ERCOT side and how deeper renewable intermittent subsidies could continue to cause challenges for us. Um, and, and they could take this in whatever priority they like. But, um, but there, you know, ERCOT is a 90% of our market, but all Texans matter. And there are a few Texans that are part of markets called MISO, the Mid-Intercontinental mid uh, uh, System Interconnect, and then it's SPP. And those folks are either in Northwest, uh, Northeast, or far Southeast Texas. So under the auspices of, or, or the, the legitimate uh, issue that we care about all Texans, um, one of the unique hats that Chairman Walker you know, has is, how do you oversee the participants in that market? And how do you interact with those market RTOs, ISOs, to figure out how to push back on the influence. I mean, it, it just proves how hard her job is, but she doesn't get to just think about ERCOT. She has to worry about SBP and MISO, and this may be, unlike last time, uh, a time when those RTOs and ISOs really become a, a center point of demonstrating to the administration that this 2035 decarbonization goal will just be hugely destructive to the grids in those spaces, and even though they're not as clean cut as being able to show it in ERCOT, what do you think will happen? I mean, you got your crystal ball with regard to MISO and SPP, and what kind of what kind of procedures could be deployed to to work with those those uh, groups to try to circle the wagons? Chairman. So, and you forgot WEC. Oh yes, yeah. and WEC. We got yes. El Paso. Sorry, we have El Paso. So Sorry, El Paso. Have four, and uh, so, yeah, you four. I think El Paso is actually one of the hardest that we've got coming for us because uh, New Mexico mm -hmm. has such such aggressive. They they make California look um, right. very to the right. Yeah. Uh, good point. <laughs> That's good point. They have yeah. some very aggressive things and. Um, 
El Paso has asked to build a gas power plant to help with some of it, and they they rejected that and said only only renewables, no no more right. anything. So, um, as to SPP and and MISO, um, I'm on the SPP. All these acronyms: Regional State Committee. It is a committee of um, the. Um, a commissioner from each of the states that is a member, has members within SPP. We, our, our authority is over resource adequacy and transmission um, uh, pricing and transmission build out. Um, I will say while, while you have influence on that, I'm, I'm in the leadership thing, I, although my term's coming up in August, I am supposed to serve as the president of that in three years, so we'll figure that out. But, um, you know, it, it's hard because there's 14 other states and those 14 other states have very diverse, uh, uh, and most of it comes through their, their legislature. They, they set these standards for, the legislatures in these <laughs> states set the standards for what decarbonization they're gonna have. And, and so it's very hard because they're all very different. And you know, I've learned that what I thought of one state ends up not being true. And most other states, I think we are the only state with load growth. Everyone else is losing load. So they're trying to figure out what to do with their generation that is in a capacity market mm -hmm. and their customers are paying for it even though it's not running. Mm -hmm. um, so th the dynamics there are difficult, especially when you're dealing with 14 other states and trying to weigh that because they're arguing and what I bet is best for Texas ratepayers. And uh, I can tell you most other states don't agree that that's what's best for their state. Uh, we've got plenty wind and solar. I don't need to build more transmission to get that to right. me. Iowa and Kansas are trying to build and all types of transmission on the backs of every other state mm -hmm. to get their wind out to, to loads because they don't have load mm -hmm. in Iowa. Um, my so, uh, Arthur DeAndrea is on the OMS, which I'm not sure, I don't remember what that stands for, but it's the leadership of the commissioners from all those states. MISO also has a capacity market. Um, they have a lot of northern states and then they have the energy southern states and I, I don't serve on that, but um, there's a lot of politics just between the North and the South in that. I mean, they've wanted to secede from that union. And <laughs> so it, again, it's, it's hard when you're dealing with all these other state commissions that have state policy set by their legislature that those commissioners are having to implement. And all of us are trying to do not only what's best for our state, but what's best for the region. Mm -hmm. And it, it is difficult to weigh all that and, and to coordinate it. Yeah. So yeah. I would love for Chairman Hancock to do that on the legislator. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, I, just, to, just, to, just to give him a little time to think about that, um, you know, in, in, in MISO, for example, the head of MISO has explicitly said, and this has been a part of a conversation, legislative conversations in North Dakota and Indiana, places like that where North Dakota has both SPP and MISO and Indiana's mm -hmm. in MISO. And, and, and I will tell you the, the really kind of shocking, truthful statement, but it was the first time I've heard an RTO head say it. Listen, listen we are policy takers, not policy makers, right? They, in some ways, like Chairman Walker with regard to ERCOT, are takers of state policy. So if a state within that group says, we're gonna be X renewable, they have to figure out a way to harmonize their protocols. And this comment, and I can tell you this is happening real time, in North Dakota and Indiana, those legislatures are, are talking about, well, they have to uptake all of our policies. So why don't we have a reliability policy, a non-intermittence policy, and balance the table? And that is a very intriguing concept, one that our experts are, are exploring and studying closely, again, within market-centered principles, right, of how do you actually give the ISOs and RTOs the tools they need. So, Chairman, I'm, I certainly think you all have plenty to do this session <laughs> and not a lot of time to do it, and COVID doesn't even help that, right? So I, I, I'm not making an ask of any kind, but just thinking outside the box 
Is there a role, maybe it's not this session, but next, or maybe it's an interim, I don't know, of, of thinking along those lines so that in those other markets, and I'm so glad you brought up El Paso, so all my El Paso, El Paso friends will be mad at me, Chairman. But uh, what, do, what do you think about that, the concept of, of doing something as a state that can be kind of force the hand of those RTOs? A little bit? I think with all four, especially because ERCOT is our major area, we need to be really careful that, and we need to make sure that we are working together and that the legislature is not setting, hopefully setting policy that is hard for us to implement and that makes sense for us. And what makes sense for SPP or MISO, I will tell you, will not make sense right. for ERCOT. It right. just won't. And so as a state, the legislature has balanced that. And I know we have different sections of Pura that apply to each of the different utilities that are outside of ERCOT, but you know, you may want to do that, but I would not encourage anyone to pass anything that would be statewide because I don't know right. that it applies equally to right. every single section of Texas. That's a really good bailout. I, I mean, a very good point. But, <laughs> I mean, because because it isn't going to be one size fits all with ERCOT and the other uh, the RTOs. So Chairman Hancock, what do you think? <laughs> well, I mean, it's kind of like That's I answer, pointed right? out before, is that this is about minutia. I mean, this, and part because of ERCOT, but part because that's not all of our state. Right. You know, we do have these little nuances that we deal with, and we, you know, we see policy from time to time to deal with a small section of Texas, but it's still part of Texas that's very important to those uh, officials in that area. Um, so we do try to look at policy holistically and, and our focus frankly is what would this do to you know the majority of Texas. Right. Um, before, so it, it, it is a balancing act right. and, and the details do matter right. and you know and the thing I'll point out that we just don't talk about enough all this growth we're talking about, I mean, Chairman Walker talked about load growth and we have another, it's because businesses are moving here. Mm -hmm. And yes, they're moving here because of our policies. But frankly, more businesses are moving here, especially in this area, because of the leadership we have in our energy sector that they believe in. Mm -hmm. And it's, I mean, there are two of the three people on this panel are brilliant. And and we put a lot of my left. <laughs> and we put a lot of trust into them, uh, and they do a phenomenal job. And that really is why businesses are moving here because there is nothing more valuable to a business than the energy in order to operate. And it, in many of them, it's eighty percent of their cost. So it is what they. I mean, they love our conservative policies. Don't get me wrong; they love our tax policies and all of that but they love our energy policy and they like knowing that, hey, these people know what they're doing and the two people beside me are a huge reason that businesses are confident moving out of California and moving to Texas. Right. right. And, and the first question I get, because I, I get called to the governor's office to meet with these companies and, and the first question I get is, uh, where in Texas can we site that I can get reliable power? Mm -hmm. And the second question is, where can I site to get reliable water? Yeah. And I get to have both of those, so lucky. Yeah. And, yeah. Uh, but those, those are the things, those are some very important things to these companies. And tax and, policy doesn't matter if you yeah. don't have electricity. Yeah. 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 Right. It, it just doesn't. It, it doesn't. That's right. Yeah. It's really good. Really good. Well, I mean, that tells you, I mean, that's just, I'm so glad you drove home those points. And, and we kind of, con we'll conclude this topic with Mr. Wilson with maybe a, a, a little bit of a pivot, um, but the same topic. I want to talk about MISO. Uh, I'm kidding. No, yeah, I exactly. <laughs> I don't want to put that Are on you here. leaving environmental, though? Um, no, I'm actually in, in go, go ahead, Jeremy. Say on environmental, please. Well, it just it kind of ticks me off that tech, <laughs> nobody wants to talk about what Texas has done. Oh, yeah. Uh, like leading the nation in wind energy. In fact, leading the world in yep. wind energy. Yeah. We're one of the top. Uh, oh, and by the way, you want air emission reductions? Uh, President Biden would look to Texas because nobody has right. 
uh, decreased emissions more than the state of Texas right. under a free market approach. Mm -hmm. And so you want to know what works in, in having cleaner water, cleaner air. Texas has led the charge, right. but nobody wants to talk about right. it, period. And I think it's because we're a conservative state, we're a Republican state, and you don't want to sit there and say, well, the state that's actually done the best job of reducing emissions, that's done the best job of clean right. water, they're not suing our elected officials because of lead in, in water. Right. That's right. We've led the charge on it. Nobody wants to talk about it. And look, I, clean air, clean water is very popular mm -hmm. politically now. The problem is we don't get any credit for it. Right. And we've actually led the nation in it. And so, right. all right, I'm done. No, I, I mean, I Chairman, had to vent a little I'm, bit I'm glad and, you said it. And, I'll, and, I'll, and we come to things like this and we, and we don't brag about right, it. Right, exactly. I mean, I'm, it, it, this is a shameless plug, but it's actually a really important one. So the whole reason Life Powered was created is because when, when, when Chip Roy, uh, was heading the program, and they did a massive year-long polling and, 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 and focus group across the country about energy issues. That issue, the absolute ignorance of how much we've accomplished with free market approaches is probably the most shocking thing you will ever see in a poll. And as soon as you educate, everybody knows how polls work, as soon as you tell them some basic facts, whether it's about Texas or even the country for that matter, which is surprising. But it's groups like this, groups yeah. like this need to talk yeah, about it absolutely. and we don't. We yeah. talk about policy, we talk about yeah. you know, low cost energy. It's okay for us to talk yeah. about environmental issues because Texas, we're doing a great yeah. job. Yeah. And, and to your point, when Obama won, Clean power plan came out. We were trying to press them to go to give us credit for the last 20 years of the work we've done because of the investment in renewables. Like I said, I'm agnostic to this. Mm -hmm. Where the challenge is we need to tweet potentially some of how the dispatch takes place in the only market so there's everyone participating. Right. But the beauty of what the state did in letting renewables come in and has continued to do has created a, a lot more resources that's very economic. It's just a reliability issue we have to tweak in a way. And I, I want to be, we don't even get credit to your point. We yeah. say, look, we've done all this. Look how much cleaner the air is now for non-attainment. Right. And, and I'll tell you, as a geeky air lawyer who does this for a living, I mean, the, the details matter. And Brent Bennett and Jason Isaac and, and our whole team has done a great job of making this accessible to normal people as opposed to people like me. Texas did that with technology, not ideology. Okay, we put massive controls on coal plants and, and made gas plants more efficient and controlled those op emissions and we built the renewable fleet and we did that with technology that wasn't put on the backs of ratepayers. Right. They were market-based principles. I just want to encourage conservative groups. Yeah. It's okay to have a group dedicated to environmental issues because from mm -hmm. a practical data-driven <laughs> Yeah. analysis, it is the free market in right. Texas that has led the charge nationally in these environmental issues. As conservatives, we need to start talking about it. It is yeah. popular with constituents, right. but the reality is that the California model doesn't work. Right. Guess what model works? Mm -hmm. Irish right. Right. Yeah, and, and, and so anybody in this room who hasn't been to the Life Power website, shame on you because the chairman is absolutely right and we owe it to them as policy leaders to do this job better and for all the donors of this organization that make that 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 effort started as a nascent attempt to do exactly what the chairman's saying and now we get invited to every legislative body of a conservative and even a moderate state in the country because we're the only ones even attempting to tell that story which is shocking right and jason and chip could tell you this and jason could tell you this and many others as soon as they get that educational piece, it flips their perceptions of energy entirely. The, the support for a carbon-free grid disappears when they find out that the carbon sources in their thermal fleet are actually the cleanest and that they've done all these things. So to conclude kind of my, my before I let you all uh, go, go after it here, um, I think, Phil, it would be really interesting to think about. You've made reference to this dispatch characteristics. Um, I'm going to step away from environmental regulatory and go into this. We all acknowledge that federal subsidies, as much as we'd like for them not to have an impact, do, right? We know our market's been distorted even though it wasn't our fault. Well, the Biden administration, and, and, and probably this is a bigger risk now with the balance of power in the Congress, uh, maybe it's not, maybe it doesn't happen, but we could see a doubling down of those types of distortions. Um, what does Texas do? in the market you, you, you operate with in ERCOT, what do we do 
to be watching that and preparing for what could be that ZZ top line I talked about? Yeah, so I'm going to put my, if I was in D.C. hat on, and I talked to the chairman about this no. the other day. <laughs> no, don't. not personally. I'm not going to D.C. <laughs> no, thank God. <laughs> but if, if I'm them, so if you look at production tax credit, investment tax credit, and what it's done for distortion and negative pricing, if they double down on lithium ion batteries or some other kind of storage play, where they're in a sense going to drop that into our state and force us under the guise of reliability, um, then in a sense you probably would force a lot of thermal units just to close because now you have a completely subsidized play. And you, you solved, with air quotation marks, the reliability issue, but at what price? And then you could actually force the states to say to the guys, reliability, you need to pick up part of the tab. Uh, you need to do other things because you don't want the lights to go off to Chair Walker's point. So you, you hide under the rubric of reliability, under the lights not going off, under utilizing kind of a judo on the ERCOT grid. I'm concerned about that. Uh, and the irony is that lithium ion batteries have as much pollution, environmental risk as anything because of how you process them, how you build them, and how you ever dispose of them. And then the risk and volatility of where the lithium comes from in the world is very dangerous. Uh, from a geopolitical standpoint. So you've got all that stuff on the side. It didn't come from West Texas. No. Right, right. Um, so I'm, worried, I'm concerned about that. Mm -hmm. And then if we continue to double down on ITC, PTCs, on wind and solar, we continue to get more and more distortion. Solar is going to go from 3,500 megawatts to 16,000 plus probably the next two or three years. You've introduced more and more volatility. And if they don't show up, they don't have to participate. And that's, that's a question that's, that I know that they'll wrestle with as far as what the, it looks like, because you want to maintain the integrity of energy only, but you also don't want to have, in a sense, the unintended consequences of what was a noble intent 20 years ago for how this was set up on the renewable side, at the same time threatening your baseload power. Yeah. So those are things that I, that I am concerned about that I'm not alone with, and I know that under the PUC's leadership of the legislature, they also want to maintain that, that economic integrity like we're talking about, as Sherry Hancock referenced. We're working with those big companies that come in. First question they ask, as Chair Walker said, you got water, you got power, can you show up? And can you be redundant in that? Um, and we have those conversations. And then they want renewable, and there's a disconnect, y'all probably know this, but it's worth saying, every bit of renewable power that a company wants, they don't get that power. Physical power is separated from economic power. And so when someone says they're all green, sure, they're all green because they <laughs> bought it, but in reality, it's coming from somewhere in the grid that when the pricing signals happen in ERCOT, they're buying power. They're just buying electricity. Um, and that's a whole other thing that people tend to go up and go, what do you mean it's separated from my power plant right. doesn't go to X, it just goes to the grid. So those things I think we need to talk about in the next Yeah, I mean, I so. think this battery, I mean, to the chairman's point about public perception, batteries are like the new renewables. They, they, there's yeah. so little understanding. They don't understand the environmental achievements of the fossil fleet and, or, or the benefits of nuclear. And then they also kind of blindly believe in some other things. I mean, one of the reasons we hired Dr. Brent Bennett is he is a battery guy. So like, if you really want to geek out about batteries, the realities and the scalability issues, we got somebody who actually built them and we wanted to get candid views because and by the way, I think batteries are cool. Yeah. But don't make batteries your thing. Yeah, I mean, that, exactly. that's where I'm going with this. It's right. complimentary. Right. It's great to have in certain places of the grid where you're trying to create that reliability. Right. But don't bet the farm on saying, well, we're not going to put in X thousand megawatts for support that, that is two or three X off the economic price point. Yeah. Or yeah. talk about how great the environment is now. Bingo. Right. And exactly. the environmental well, benefits lithium's a problem. Yeah. Yeah. And Mining so, it, disposing yeah. of it, yeah. using yeah. it. Yeah, there's a whole other, and right you'll here. be shocked to hear this. There's a great video on the Life Powered side about a great topic that. <laughs> What's that Bennett website again, with? Mike? Lifepowered.org. <laughs> All right, so let's go to QA. We've got a great panel here. I have only one request. I'm going to go to the, here first because he asked the question. I'm going to start in the room and stay in the room until our time's up because I know we have questions and they got here early. So just ask, make it a question. That's all, I, that's all I'm asking. Okay. Uh, would you all comment on your trade off that you use from a regulatory standpoint, but, uh, uh, and also Mr. Wilson uses from a company standpoint of the trade off of uh, renewable versus uh, reliability? And also, for, for, uh, is there a, a situation where 
you know, if you generate so much uh, uh, power one way, you know, do you, what's the percentage of, of gas plants you need to, to back that up? Yeah. Don't All right. <laughs> Who wants to start? Start I, on the left. I there. mean, I believe that, that with renewables, with wind and solar, you still have a reliable system. You just have to balance that. And I don't know the percentages. I, I uh, professed early on not to be an engineer, and I don't know the percentages on that. But I, I, it's not that I think renewables are bad and they don't have any place in the system. I think they have a place in Absolutely. the system. It's just not 100%. That's right. And from a policy standpoint, what I try to focus on is allowing the market to be the market. Now that's difficult with the federal government coming in and, and putting weight on the scale. And so what we want to do is kind of level the playing field, but we look at, we also have to look at investors. I mean, look, this market is all driven by investment. People willing to buy into a market, willing to invest into a market. And so, for example, on generation, I recognize that um, the life, you know, life expectancy of a turbine versus the life expectancy of you know, a gas plant, the construction time of a turbine versus the construction time approval process of a gas plant, which doesn't always go through, as you mm -hmm. talked about in New yeah. Mexico, at any time you, know, you have, poly you Politics, have <laughs> agencies that can can it uh, and move in. So, my focus and our, a lot of our conversation is how do, we, how do we level the playing field with the federal government coming in and trying to tip the scales? And so that's what we, we try to do that and then let the market work itself out. Yeah, Bill, you want to add? I'll do a 30 second. Uh, summer a year and a half ago, summer of 2019, we had some really hot days in August. Uh, for the first time ever, our temperature decoupled from our uh, energy necessity for the risk of a rolling brownout. So what happened was wind didn't blow a given day. If wind had blown any, wind blew more than we thought it was going, if it had blown to where it was supposed to blow to, then we would have had a real risk on grid reliability that day. Even if people were shutting down, people were shutting down their excess behind the meter. And so the challenge becomes as more and more thermal continues to retire for lots of reasons, and you're more and more reliable on renewables and you don't have some ability to keep that thermal popping when you want it to be, you run that risk. And I, and I guess I'm 100% pro-electrons. It's just you don't want to create that, yeah, that thing in the process. Wind slows it. down around 2.30. I mean, just yeah. you can look at the trend analysis. And so the wind will start slowing down at 2.30. With well, demand, because of the heat, continue, it's continuing to go up. And so we look at that. And from a policy standpoint, what happens, and we know because we've um, Chairman Walker. You can call me Deanne. <laughs> Chairman Walker and I had those conversations, and Erica and I had those conversations, because yeah. we do get, when things get tight, we do get pressure to change policy. Oh, we got, you know, when we go from 15 to 7, oh, we've got to change policy. I'm pretty chill, um, and so I'm more inclined to say, you know what? And, and it happens in most markets. Most markets don't move in things, until things get tight. Most investment doesn't come in until things, you know, that supply demand gets tight for, for market reasons. So I'm more inclined to sit tight because, and see what happens in the marketplace than I am to react and turn around because we went to seven and say, okay, we got to change policy. We need to get back to 15. No, maybe maybe our new norm is, you know, 7 to 10. Nine. And we're not going to have. Nine. Yeah. yeah, seven, nine. Okay, maybe, and, and we're not going to have these huge plants anymore. We're going to have smaller plants that take less time to build and investors, because investors want a return on their investment. So I'm, I really kind of approach it all from a, a business standpoint of, all right, the market's going to shift. Let's let the market adjust and let's not try to legislate change or re legislate keeping things the same, either one. 
Yeah, and, and, and the bottom line, and we'll go here with the next question, that gap, that gap that m is made up by all of our thermal fleet when the wind doesn't blow and the sun doesn't shine, the, both chairmen have identified, we've figured out a way for that, that thermal fleet to stay alive. The, the threat, the fight, frankly, to the death will be to make sure that nobody in Washington or anybody else thinks that that delta can get made up by a battery because it's well, a big chunk of Well, power. we don't have that gap anymore. Right. Well, I mean, well, we are running, we're not running yeah. at 15. Yeah, no, anymore. I just mean, I just mean if, if we didn't have a thermal fleet. Right. I, I mean, that we, we've got to be able to ramp up and run down is the no. point. Yeah, Chairman. So let's go here. Yeah, so I'm concerned about <clears throat> as we need more power, um, not being able to build a power plant because it's not going to be able to sell enough to get pay out. Is it reasonable to ask those that are bringing in more interruptible power, like wind, solar, to have their own backup? Uh. That they contract with somebody for their own backup? I'll let these two answer that. Especially with smaller power generations. The question du jour in at least six states, I can tell you. I'm going to let Chairman, I'm going to let uh, Phil Wilson, uh, with deference to the Chairman and maybe even so, with, with celebration, I'm going to let Phil Wilson talk about this. So as a market participant on both the transmission and the power side, I believe that is a tweak that should be considered. Back to my internet analogy where you didn't pay taxes 20 years ago. When you have production tax credits and investment tax credits and you have negative pricing put together, and that's not a market design issue. That's where federal government did stuff to distort what happens. And so when you aren't able to dispatch in ERCOT because the sun's not shining that day and the wind's not blowing, I think that's a consideration that we would have a conversation around. And hopefully it's not real expensive because you're still doing energy only. You're having them having to buy energy from somebody else. Like every other company has to do, on the thermal side, this is not unique to market design. If we commit to being somewhere on a given day as a power provider and we aren't able to show up, we have to acquire that power. That's just how the market works. And so in this new environment, when you have a great deal of wind and a great deal of solar, which is good, it's good for all the reasons we've talked about, I think there's a conversation at least to have on maybe you ought to participate more in doing your share. The other part that's been great is we have required interconnect under the PUC rules. If you're a generator coming in and you want to build a power plant, we have to hook you up. That allows that ease of use, which is probably a good thing. So I'll be a conversation too about are there better ways to improve upon that in a way that people participate more in that process as a generator. And like I said, I wear both hats right. in that way. So yeah, I think it's at least a conversation that the regulators and legislators could have. Well, I bought, yeah, go ahead, Chair. I'm, Finish up. I'm going there go. because, as we pointed out, uh, this is where I'm not a very good politician, but hopefully I'm a good chairman. Um, we talked wind and solar. They're produced where the demand's not, right? Thermals typically will build where the demand is or close to it because of the cost of transmission that's, right. that's in there. We, early on, as a state, in order to incentivize shifting of our portfolio of energy, um, paid for Uber rides to the farthest grocery store <laughs> in order for you to shop there because it was the newest. You also paid for the road. And yeah. we paid for the road. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It's a great and, analogy. And everybody shared that cost. And it is, it's the, I mean, mm -hmm. to try to simplify it, yeah. Yeah. Um, renewables would be like building a phenomenal grocery store where nobody lived. <coughs> and then the state or consumers. With all free con food. With free food. With free food. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And, and all consumers, <laughs> including competitors, paid for the ride and the road mm -hmm. to get to that store so that you could shop there because it was the sexiest store in town. In the state. That's fantastic. In the state. And yes. so uh, politically addressing this issue is dangerous. As chairman of the committee, we have to address this issue. Um, it doesn't mean that I don't like renewables. It doesn't mean that we don't have a place for them. But again, I'm a practical guy that's happy going home if, 
if that's what my constituents want. But I want to do my job so that 20 years from now, we're, Texas in a, we're in a better place, and we have to address it. Right. And we have to address it sooner rather than later because it will impact the state 5, 10, 20 years down the road. Wow, what a great way to close. Now, I know there's other questions. Please come to the panel after we do it. But because we owe it to these leaders to actually have people understand why what he just said is good for Texas and not bad politics, we need people to be smarter about it. So we're going to just let everybody go if they have to go, but we're going to play this last video. Thank you, everybody, for being here.